For the next hour, we're going to take a look at controlling cholesterol. Uh, most everybody is aware that a high cholesterol is really bad for you. What does it do? Causes heart attacks and strokes, right? And why is everybody so aware of that? You know why you're so aware of that? Because the pharmaceutical industry has put billions of dollars, not million, billions of dollars into marketing their cholesterol-lowering drugs. The cholesterol-lowering drugs, we call them the statins, are the number one most profitable drug in the pharmaceutical history. The uh, billions that have been made on Lipitor and Crestor and Zocor and some of these other cholesterol-lowering drugs um, exceeds the profits of any other drug that uh, they've ever manufactured. So uh, there's a lot of money behind the usage of these drugs for cholesterol. cholesterol. And of course, they've got a great marketing tool because what is the number one cause of death in this country? Heart attacks. Well, how many people are going to be concerned about that? And what's the underlying you know, disease process, this arteriosclerotic process with high blood pressure? Well, how many people have that? I mean, we realize that this is the major problem, and they say that here is the number one cure is to take these drugs that lower your cholesterol. Um, do you know how the drugs work to lower your cholesterol? Well, inside your body, you actually make cholesterol. Did you know that? Now, why would God make your body make something that's bad for you? Well, it's not bad for you. It's absolutely essential for life. You could not live without cholesterol. We use cholesterol to make some very important hormones in the body. Uh, estrogen, testosterone, uh, vitamin D is actually a hormone that's made out of cholesterol, DHEA, uh, aldosterone, cortisol, and many others are made out of cholesterol. Uh, but even more important, we use cholesterol in cell membranes, particularly the cell membranes in the brain. These membranes have to have the right electrical potential across them, the right consistency, the right quality, so that they can transmit a nerve impulse, which is transmitted right along the surface of the membrane. And you have to have the right kind of membrane. And by putting cholesterol molecules inside that membrane, it makes it the right quality. If we don't have the right amount of cholesterol in there, the membranes won't be of the right quality and function quite as well. However, most of the cholesterol that your body makes is not used in hormones or in cell membranes. It's used to make bile. You know what bile is? Bile is something you use to digest fat with. Okay. So your body needs it, so your body makes it, and most of it is made in the cholesterol. Although brain cells and other cells can make it, most of your cholesterol is made in the liver, which makes sense because most of it is used in your gallbladder to store as bile. Now, in your liver, the way you make a cholesterol molecule it's sort of like a little assembly line, a factory. You start with one enzyme here that does the first step, and then it passes it on to the next tool, which does the next step, passes on the next one, and goes on down the line till you get to the very end, and you end up with a cholesterol molecule. Well, the way these cholesterol-lowering drugs work is they go right to the very first step in that assembly line factory, and they jam up the first tool in the assembly line. Well, now, if you jam up the first tool in the assembly line so it doesn't work, what happens to the assembly line? Well, you shut it down because if you can't do the first step, there's no product to pass on to the second step and so on down the line. So if you jam up the first step, it's, you've shut down that particular assembly line. And that's what these statin drugs do. They jam up the first tool in the cholesterol manufacturer assembly lines. That's how they work. Now... When you think about it, God designed all of these delicate parts of the body to work a certain way. And when you start jamming up something that God designed, what's going to happen? 
yeah, you're going to start creating problems, right? When you start jamming up something that he made and said was very good, and we say, well, no, it's not very good. Let's jam it up because we think it's bad. Um, because cholesterol is bad. But actually, did you know that 50% of the patients who have a heart attack have a normal cholesterol level? Oh, wait a minute then. Does cholesterol actually cause heart attacks? Well, actually, a high cholesterol level is like a high blood sugar level. It's a symptom. It's not the cause. It's almost a parallel cause in a way, if you want to think about it in some senses. It's a, uh, how shall we say, the lifestyle that causes heart attacks is the same lifestyle that causes high cholesterol levels. So we see the two together, and there's associated people with high cholesterol, more heart attacks. But, like I said, half the people that have uh, heart attacks have normal cholesterol levels. So why are they having heart attacks? Well, because they have the same underlying arteriosclerotic problem. And so you've got to realize that there's not that direct cause. It's more of a symptom of the underlying disease process, the underlying lifestyle. The same lifestyle we talked about last lecture when we talked about type 2 diabetes, we're talking about here with heart disease, arterial sclerosis building up in the artery walls and the amount of cholesterol in the blood. But the high cholesterol level is a symptom that's like, yeah, we don't want a high cholesterol because if you've got a high cholesterol level, that's a symptom that you're on a lifestyle that's leading to a heart attack. So, yeah, we want your cholesterol levels go, but jamming up the machinery can cause problems. What are some of the problems with the statin drugs? Well, one of the problems, remember this assembly line I was telling you about here? About halfway down the assembly line, as you keep changing this molecule, the product at this particular point, halfway down there, is called ubiquinone. Or another name for it is CoQ10. Have you heard of CoQ10? In other words, this product here is also used there. Now, sometimes you can take it and go on down the assembly line and make cholesterol, but you can also take it out of the assembly line and use it. And we use a lot of this in the body. And where do we use it? Inside the mitochondria, the little energy cell. Remember inside the cell where we took the glucose apart to get all the energy out of it? Well, all of those little steps in getting the energy out of the glucose molecule, the very last step in that needs CoQ10. So if we don't have enough CoQ10, that very last step doesn't work. Now, if the very last step doesn't work, what happens? Well, then the step before it starts building up, right? And the step before that then starts backing up. And so pretty soon you end up with the whole glucose, you know, where you break down glucose thing backing up, and you've got all these halfway products backed up in there because we can't get through that last step because we don't have enough CoQ10 because we've jammed up our factories that make the CoQ10 with the statin drugs. So now we've got an energy problem, because if we can't break down the glucose as good, we're not going to get as much energy out of it, and the energy levels are going to be lower. Well, what parts of the body are going to be most sensitive to this decrease in getting energy out of our food? Well, the ones that use the most energy, the brain and the muscles. And particularly, the muscles burn a lot of energy, but not only the skeletal muscles, but also in the very center of your chest is a very important muscle. Yeah. Uh, since the introduction of the statin drugs, there has been a 600% increase in congestive heart failure in this country. What's congestive heart failure? Where the heart muscle is too weak and it's not pumping enough blood and fluids back and up in the lungs or tissue that are not working right. Um, we need that CoQ10. It's interesting, the manufacturers of Lipitor knew that. Did you know when they patented Lipitor? They also patented a combination drug of Lipitor plus CoQ10 so they could supply it. But they never manufactured that drug. They just made the patent and sat on it and kept quiet about it. They figured uh, unless somebody made a big enough uproar about it, they weren't going to do anything about it, you know? 
They figured that we don't want to point out the problem that this drug is causing a problem by putting the solution out there, so we'll just be quiet. It's, and so they never manufactured that particular combination drug. But, you know, if you're on one of those statin drugs and plan to stay on it, at least take CoQ10 along with it and try to, you know, supplement up to make up for the, you know, the damage it's doing there. The skeletal muscles, uh, people on the, can often get muscles, aches, and pains. Those muscle aches and pains can often be a symptom that the muscles have, the energy level is so low that they're actually having pain, damage in them. And in a few cases, we've seen it, where the muscle damage gets so f severe, we have what we call rhabdomyolysis. That's just a big word that means the muscle is coming apart. And when it does that, when it starts coming across, it releases its internal, you know, workings, one of which is something called myoglobin. It's, it's something that holds oxygen inside of a muscle cell. And myoglobin free in the bloodstream jams up the kidney. And so we've had people that go into rhabdomyolysis, the myoglobin jams up the kidneys, they go into renal failure. And so we had people go into complete total, you know, renal failure and lose their kidneys from these drugs. Um, another interesting effect that we have had seen in some people is the effect on the brain. Um, I knew someone who uh, they uh, were told they needed to go in Lipitor. They put them on 10 milligrams. I needed to take uh, Lipitor. Is 10 milligrams a high dose or a low dose? That's a low dose, a very low dose, yeah. I mean, 40 is kind of considered a standard dose, and lately they've been encouraging, go to 80 because, well, we want better control. We're not getting enough control with 40. Go to 80. You really should have your patients on 80. And for the last two years, they've been trying to push, go to 80, try to get people under control, you know. Sell twice as much drug, right? Make twice as much money. Okay. Um, but uh, they're encouraging these very high levels. They're also encouraging a lot lower cholesterol levels as the normal, the goal, if we can get better control. So if people with even a little bit of elevated cholesterol, well, they need to be on more drugs, you know. Uh, somebody was encouraging, we started should putting uh, teenagers on it, you know. Some people even suggest, well, we should just put them on ahead of time to prevent high cholesterol, we should just start putting people on these drugs to prevent them ever getting high cholesterol level. We should be preventing these problems rather than treating them. So everything's trying to get more and more of this drug in the system. Anyway, this individual, um, they were told to go on 10 milligrams. And over the next few weeks, they started noticing uh, the brain seemed to just a little bit foggy, a little bit thing. They noticed the coordinates, like when you're driving, it's kind of like everything's a little bit slow, like you're going around the corner and you can't catch up with where you're, where you're going. And it got more and more severe till it, they couldn't drive. They had, it took about four, four weeks or so, they had gotten to the point where they couldn't drive anymore. And um, I was talking, I was telling them, they were telling me about this, and this is when I found, I was looking up and reading about it, and I found where this is a reported side effect, uh, this effect on the brain. And so we checked their, their cholesterol had dropped down to 117, and uh, well, they were, you know, had this terrible effect. So we stopped the Lipitor immediately. And over the next few weeks, they gradually got better. And, uh, you know, by about another four weeks, they were back to normal and could drive again and function normally. So we know that these drugs, when you start jamming up and things don't work right, you are affecting various parts of the body. Some people seem not to have as much side effects, some more, some put up with them, some don't. But I often wonder, because this particular side effect of the slowing of the brain, I mean, who is it that we're usually putting on these cholesterol-lowering drugs? They're often older senior citizens. And, well, what happens when you go older? Well, the mind starts to go a little bit. And, well, they're just getting older. and We don't realize, hey, they're not just getting older. It's this drug that's making them that way. Uh, so, anyway, there's problems with those. We would like to have normal cholesterol levels, not high cholesterol levels. And so I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about controlling cholesterol naturally. And by the way, you can at uh, the Weimar Institute where we treat diabetes and reverse it. Guess what? Cholesterol levels come down when you go on the whole plant food diet and walking. And it's particularly the dietary aspects that have to do with cholesterol, maybe more so than the walking. Um, but all those things help bring the uh, getting on the right diet, bring it down. But I'd like to explain a little bit, like we did with diabetes, how that works in the body so you can understand why 
the whole plant food eaten, whole diet is actually the diet for lowering cholesterol as well. So to understand that, take a look at the digestive system. So we'll start up here. Where does the digestive system start? In your mouth. Okay, there. That's, does that look like a mouth? See, there's his nose, his mouth, his chin. Okay, that's the mouth. Uh, from your mouth, where does the food go? Goes down the esophagus, a tube that takes you down to the stomach. By the way, this is more of a diagram than an anatomical drawing. <laughs> so we just got to get all the parts in here. Okay, so there's a stomach. And after it goes through the stomach, where does it go? Goes into the small intestines. Small intestines is where we carry on the process of digestion. And this is where absorption, almost all of the nutrients that we absorb from our food are absorbed in the small intestine. Huge amount. Of, it's not like this. It's 22 feet long, but I won't draw 22 feet of it here for us. After it leaves the small intestine, where does it go? It goes into the large intestine, which we sometimes call the colon. And I'll draw that over here. Now, obviously, this isn't where it is in the body, but this kind of lays it all out so we can see it here. And then eventually it comes to the rectum and it passes out of the body. So there we have the tube that makes up the digestive system. But there's some other important parts of the digestive system that we're going to draw in here that are attached to this big long tube. Now one of those is the liver. So I'm going to draw a liver up here. Start labeling it because you couldn't tell by where they are in this picture what they are. Now the liver does thousands of important metabolic chemical processes for the body, absolutely essential for life. But one of those thousands of things it does is make bile. And the bile it makes comes out in a little tubes called bile ducts, come together here. And after they come out, there's a little sack for storing bile. What do we call that? The gallbladder. So I'm going to draw the gallbladder here. And it's got a little tube, connects it on there. And then from there, there's a tube that goes on down. It goes behind the stomach. And it goes to the very first part of the small intestine here. And there's a little opening there. And uh, we got some green here. Let me label the gallbladder here. This bile in here. And the bile comes out, and the bile is released into the intestines here where it can help us digest fat. Bile is an emulsifier. You know what it means to emulsify something? Oil and water don't mix. If you put oil and water in a jar, what happens? They separate. Now, what if you take that jar and you shake it up really, really, really hard to get them all mixed up really good, and then you stop, what happens? They're still separated. We need something to mix the oil with water so we can digest it and absorb it. By the way, we need oil in our diet, right? Essential fatty acids. You can't live. A 100% fat-free diet is a very unhealthy diet. The problem is, of course, we were talking earlier, the huge excesses of refined oils we put in the diet. But on a whole plant food diet, you should be including seeds and nuts that have all of these essential fatty acids in it. By the way, have you noticed uh, somebody did some research and found, oh, if you add a handful of walnuts to your diet every day, you lower your risk of heart attacks. And then the almond people didn't, yeah, if you add a handful of walnuts. And they said, oh, temperate nuts. So then the macadamia nut growers, they paid some money and got somebody to do some research. And guess what? A handful of macadamia nuts makes you healthier and lowers your risk of heart attack. You know, all of these whole foods God made actually make you healthier. So you don't have to be afraid of nuts like, oh, they're bad for me. They have a lot of fat in them. That's the way you're supposed to get the fat. The problem is what's in a bottle that's been refined. That's the problem. Bile is an emulsifying agent. It allows us to digest fat. 
uh, fat that's absolutely essential for the human body, but we can't absorb it because everything is a water-based system. And so we're going to need to mix it up. And we gave the example of a pan that's really greasy and the water doesn't clean it, but you put soap in there and now it dissolves in the water and it all goes down the drain. Well, that's an emulsifier. Your bile works like soap to mix any fat in the diet with water so that it can be digested and absorbed by the body. Okay? And as we were saying, this bile is made out of cholesterol. So cholesterol and all the bile salts, if you saw their chemical form, you see they look just like cholesterol with some minor changes. So this is all basically a cholesterol solution that a modified cholesterol solution that we use to emulsify the fat. Now the body has built in a little recycling center in the very last part of the small intestines here. This area right here is where all of this bile and cholesterol can be absorbed. And there are special receptors for absorbing cholesterol. So this is where the cholesterol is taken out of the intestines and absorbed into the bloodstream and then circulates through the blood. So this is how it gets into the blood from the very last part. This small intestine isn't uniform tube. It's different in all of its parts. One part does one thing, one part, and of course, I mean one, it does hundreds of things, but it changes. Different parts do different parts of the digestive process. It's actually a very complex, very well-designed processing plant with a huge absorptive surface uh, for digesting and absorbing all the nutrients we need. But it's in the last section here is where we absorb cholesterol. So now I'm going to give you three principles for controlling your cholesterol. Principle number one starts right up here. And it has to do with the fact that we've already talked about that your body needs cholesterol. It's absolutely essential for life. It's also true that every other animal needs cholesterol. Cows need cholesterol in their body. Lizards need cholesterol. Fish need cholesterol. And all of the animal kingdom needs cholesterol and makes cholesterol. Plants don't need cholesterol, and plants don't make cholesterol. And there is no plant that we know of that actually makes cholesterol. Somebody said, well, what about coconuts? They don't have cholesterol. They make coconut oil, and various, but they don't make cholesterol, avocados and that. There is no cholesterol in plants. Plants are 100% cholesterol free. By the way, they do some funny advertising with that. Have you seen these big bottles of corn oil? 100% cholesterol free. Well, of course, they're corn. They're a plant, you know. That doesn't mean they're good for you, but they're putting out their 100% cholesterol free, and they're just floated with huge amounts of oil that's not good for you. But that's uh, beside the point there. Anyway, so they don't, no plants have it, but every animal has it. Now, here's the problem. Your body already makes all the cholesterol that you need, but now you eat the cow. Now you've got your cholesterol plus the cow's cholesterol. And then you eat the chicken, and then you eat some eggs, and then you drink some milk, and then you have some cheese. And now what's happening? Now you have your cholesterol plus everybody else's cholesterol. Now do you see how that could be a problem? Your body already makes all you need, but now you have everybody else's in addition to that. So we're going to put number one right up here, principle number one. Going into the mouth there. And what is principle number one? Don't eat everybody else's cholesterol. Okay? Leave the cow, the chicken, the, everybody their own cholesterol. Don't eat everybody else's cholesterol. Now, principle number two is going to take place down here in the stomach. So say we are strictly vegan and we have absolutely We've got this principle down, and I eat no eggs, no cheese, not a drop of milk, nothing. I have absolutely nobody else's cholesterol. My diet is 100% cholesterol-free. Now, 
But if I still have a lot of oil in my diet, pure vegetable oil, corn oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, all these different vegetable oils, when they get down here to the stomach, and there's a lot of oil right here, the stomach is intelligent. It's got its sensors, it knows what's there, and it says, oh, well, there's lots of oil we need to digest here. We're going to need lots of bile. And it actually sends a message up to the liver. I'll use a different color here. And you know what it tells the liver? Make more cholesterol. Yeah, make more cholesterol. And so the liver says, okay, and it starts building cholesterol factories and making more cholesterol because he knows you've got a big fatty meal to digest here. So he's building more cholesterol factories, building more cholesterol factories to churn out more cholesterol so we can make lots of bile so we can digest all of this fat here. So put number two down here so we can that right there. Now on the diet that we were talking about, whole plant foods eaten whole, where's the fat? We've eliminated all of these bottles of refined oil, but is there still fat in the diet? Yeah, like say walnuts. You've got a handful of you eating walnuts or peanuts or whatever. When you take a whole plant food whole, where is the oil inside of a walnut? Well, it's inside the little cells that make up the walnut, little walnut cells. There are plants. Plants are made out of cells, and there's little plant cells in there. And if you looked under the microscope at a walnut cell, where's the oil inside the cell? Well, there's little sacs, little vacuoles, little sacs in there, and the oil's inside those little sacs inside there. Well, now there's an important reason for that, and that is to keep oxygen away from it. Oxygen does really bad stuff to oil. We know, you know when oil gets rancid, you can tell it's, that's oxygen damage you're smelling. It's actually breaking up the long chains and the little pieces, and the little pieces are so volatile they float in the air, and you can smell them and say, oh, it's rancid. That means you've got a lot, of, a lot of oxygen damage on that oil. By the way, even the nuts, eventually the stuff can get in. If you had nuts that smelled rancid, that means they got a lot of oxygen damage. Throw them out, don't eat them. Never eat rancid, something that smells rancid from the oil that's going bad in there. But anyway, the way God designed it, there is the shell around the nut and then a seed coat around it and there's like a skin around the walnut there and then there's the cells and they have a cell wall and inside. So it takes a while for oxygen to get actually damage that. So this is protected, safe, clean. It doesn't have damaged. Because we're going to find out later as we look at it, damaged fat is one of the major causes of this arterial sclerosis, this hardening of the arteries, this cholesterol plaque that's building up in your artery that we're measuring back there. One of the major things is oil that is damaged, bad fat. But anyway, this is protected. It's safe, it's clean, it's good. And when you chew it up, where's the oxygen? I mean, where's the oxygen? Where is the fat? It's still inside those little vacuoles. Even when you chewed it up real good, you've still got clumps of cells. The oil is still protected and safe. And when you swallow it, it's not till it gets in the stomach and you start getting the hydrochloric acid and the proteolytic enzymes ripping those cells to shreds that we actually release the oil as a free oil. And now it's in solution, separated from oxygen. And so you get nice, clean, undamaged fat. It's not oxidized, no free radical formation. And it's actually very good for you rather than very bad for you. Good fat rather than bad fat. What makes it good is it's not oxygen damaged. So, anyway, we got that down here, but we don't have the excess amounts of it. Now, if we wanted to put a name on this rule number two, don't turn on the cholesterol factories with a high-fat diet. And, of course, we already talked about the amount of fat. If, you, if the only corn oil you got for, was from eating corn, how much would you get? Remember we talked uh, 15 per spoon? ears of corn for a spoon of corn oil? Yeah, that would be a tablespoon size. So don't turn on the cholesterol factories with a high-fat diet. These, when there's a lot of free fat, the french fries or whatever, what's happening here is it's sending a message to the liver, 
and it's really making more of this, which of course goes through here, gets recycled here, and increases your uh, blood levels. Now, when you make more cholesterol factories, how long do they last? Anybody know? They last a couple of weeks. Um, there's a story shared to me by Dr. Crane, one of the doctors at Weimar Institute. And he had this patient that went through on the healthy program and went home and he came back for his one month follow up and his cholesterol level was still really high. And he says, well that shouldn't be that high. You've been on this now through the program, you've been home for a month, your cholesterol level should be down to normal. And he says, what are you eating? He says, oh I'm eating in the program, whole plant foods, whole, that's all I'm eating. Well, now, Dr. Crane, he's a scientist. He doesn't take that for, oh, okay, well. No, he goes, he gets out his paper and says, okay, for Monday, what did you have for breakfast? What did you have for Sunday? What did you have for, and he goes through, a, and, well, every Sunday, he rewarded himself for staying on the diet and went with his friends down to the, you know, golden calorie or whatever, and had a burger and fries and milkshake and rewarded himself with a reward for having been on the diet. So once a week, he went down and made sure he had all of his cholesterol factories maxed out and going strong. And then he stayed on the diet for a week, and then he had another big meal maxed him out again. So Dr. Crane explained to him what he was doing and what was going on. So then he realized, okay, I've got to change that too. And so he switched. He realized he could get a baked potato, and he could have some, you know, help some vegetables with that or some beans or, you know, the different healthy things that he could pick at the restaurant instead of these high fat things. And then in another month, recheck actually, oh, his cholesterol was coming down nicely. So don't turn on your cholesterol factories with fat in the diet, principle number two. Now, principle number three has to do with fiber. Do you know what fiber is? It's the part of your food you don't digest. Scientists used to think, well, that's worthless. That, there's no purpose to that. But now we realize that, yeah, fiber is absolutely essential to good health. God put it in there for a reason. And one of the reasons has to do with its role in digestion. By the way, where do you find fiber in your food? Whole plants, right. Do animals have fiber? No, no animal food. What about really tough, hard, chewy meat? Is there fiber in that? No. What's making it tough and chewy is various protein uh, stuff in there, but it's not fiber. Fiber is actually a carbohydrate that's not digestible. It has a different type of chemical bond putting the pieces together so that it's not digested, and you end up with these, these big, long chains that don't digest, but they add bulk to the food. Every single whole plant food has fiber in it not just the bran. You know, we used to think, oh, the bran on the wheat, that's fiber. That's true, that's one kind of fiber. There's hundreds of kinds of fiber, and we're actually finding the most valuable fiber is not the bran fiber, it's what we call the soluble fiber. Think of a really ripe, sweet apricot. Juicy, thing. you don't think of that as fibrous, but that gel-like stuff that makes the fruit what it is, that really almost liquidy, sweet apricot, that's fiber. And all of these fruits, that sweet, jello-y part, that's fiber. And that's really the best fiber for you, more important than the brand fibers. But anyway, this fiber, when it goes to the stomach, it's combined with water here, it just turns into a big jelly-like sponge, spongy mass, and it passes through the intestines. And where is all of the nutrients in the food? all of the carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, fat, all of these different nutrients. Well, they're all soaked up and absorbed into this big sponge into which you release the digestive enzymes. So they all get mixed up in this big spongy mass and it forms this matrix and they're all mixed up in there. And this is where the digestion process takes place inside this mass of fibery material here. And so that's passing through the intestines here. Now, one of the things that's getting mixed up in there is the bile, right? Now, 
So all this vial is soaked up in this big spongy mass and it's doing its work, emulsifying, digestion, and eventually it's passed through all 22 feet of it and it passes through the last part here and out into the colon. And uh, where is all of the cholesterol right now? It's all soaked up inside this big sponge. And as the sponge goes past, how much of that sponge is actually up against the surface? A little bit of it. Most of that spongy stuff is, the, the cholesterol is not on the surface, but it's soaked up in the middle of the sponge and bound up all in this sponge. And it stays in that sponge and goes right on past the rice cycling center without getting absorbed. So all of this fiber soaks up the cholesterol and takes it right on out. And then, of course, it can pass through the colon and right on out of the body. So here's number three. Soak up your cholesterol with a high fiber sponge. Whole plant foods eaten whole, every single food is going to be full of fiber. That fiber is going to soak up the cholesterol and take it right on out of the body. So there you've got three natural principles for lowering your cholesterol without the damaging drugs. Do they work? Yeah, every month up at Weimar we watch people come up, they go on strictly the whole plant food diet without any refined oils, lots of fiber, there's no animal products coming in, and what happens to their cholesterol levels? They just go down, down, down. I normal there. So now I'd like to take a look at the underlying disease process that we're so concerned about. Arteriosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, the process that causes a heart attack and a stroke. What is it that all the bad fat and bad cholesterol is doing to us that's causing this disease process? Well, I'm going to draw a picture of an artery here. And uh, let's draw it like this, kind of like we're looking at it with that ultrasound machine here. Now, the inside, this is the inside of the artery where the blood is flowing, okay? And there is, here in the wall, there's a nice thin layer, we call it endothelium. It's a nice, smooth, slippery, single layer of cells that lines the artery and makes it nice, smooth, and slippery for the blood to flow through. And then outside of there, there's like a little muscle layer, and then there's a thicker, fibrous layer out farther there. Now, the blood that's flowing through here is a water-based system. We already talked about that. So how does the body take care of handling fats and cholesterol? You've probably all heard about good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, LDL, HDL, VLDL, that kind of stuff. I'm going to show you a real simple way to understand what all this HDL, VLD, LDL stuff is and what it means and so you can get a handle on it. Remember, like I said, it's a water-based system, so we can't put fat just loose in the bloodstream. What would happen if fat went loose in the bloodstream? It would separate out and make little globules which would start plugging up things because they're separate from the water. Uh, we see that in emergency medicine occasionally. Someone, I had a fellow, he had his legs crushed against a stone wall by the front of a, a bulldozer tractor, crushed both of his femurs badly. Well, inside the bone marrow, there's a lot of fat, a lot of open blood vessels, and you crush that all up. The fat from the bone marrow gets mixed into the blood space and circulates into the body. We call it fat embolism. We now have globules of free fat from the bone marrow now circulating in the blood. And as they go through the veins, they eventually get pumped through the right side of the heart and out into the lungs. And as the branches get smaller and smaller, they start finding, plugging up. The lungs plug up, they go into pulmonary edema, the lungs don't function, and they die. And this individual died. There's really nothing we can do once the fat gets loose in the blood. Of course, God understood all this when he designed the human body. And so he made a system of, uh, for transporting it. So we're going to draw that here like a bunch of little 
crux here. So here is a little truck here. I'm going to call this little truck LDL, low density lipoprotein. It's low density because it's full of fat. When you mix oil and water, which one floats on top of the other? Yeah, the oil floats, right? Because it's lighter, it's lower density. So this is LDL, it's full of fat, and uh, it's going out here into the arteries. There's another one, somewhat like it, only bigger. And this is like the semi-truck load here. And this is called VLDL. This is the very low density lipoprotein. And it's because it's a bigger one. If you looked at them under the microscope, they're bigger particles. But they're somewhat similar in their function right here. And these are the ones they often call bad cholesterol. The LDL, oh, your LDL is over 100. That's really bad. You got too much of the bad cholesterol. We want your LDL to be lower. But you know, it's not the fact that it's LDL that makes it bad. That's the way God designed for fat to get from your intestines to every cell in your body. Every cell in your body needs it. So it's not really a bad trucking system. It's actually a very nice trucking system. I mean, by the way, what it looks like, they look like little balls. And they're little special proteins that make up these little encasements. And then inside the center is where all the fat is, separated from the blood. And it carries it around until it gets to a cell where it attaches on special little loading dock. And it opens up and then takes the fat inside the cell where it can be used for whatever the cell needs it for. So it's actually a very nice little trucking system. What it is that makes it bad is the type of fat that goes in it. In the American diet, where does most of the fat in the diet come from? Vegetable oils and animal fats. Mm -hmm. We have a huge amount of vegetable oils used in frying and cooking, and we have a lot of animal fat. These fats are exposed to oxygen, to the air. When you start frying, deep frying, by the time, every about 10 degrees you go up, you like double the reactivity of a chemical reaction here. And so by the time you start frying something at high temperatures, we're talking about a million times more reactive, this oxygen oxidative damage. So once you start frying stuff, the oxidative damage goes way up. And what is it? The oxygen is stuck in these damaged oxidized fats are what we often refer to them as free radicals. This is what's bad. So I'm going to put some little marks on here so you can see. These are full of bad fats. They're damaged fats. So what makes them bad is what's inside, what they're carrying. Because when they get these out to the artery wall, as these start absorbing through the artery wall here to the cells through this endothelial layer, the body recognizes and says, oh man, I can see that. There's some bad fat there. And it's got a whole system designed to take care of, attack, and destroy things that are bad for you that aren't supposed to be in there. Because this free radical stuff, if it gets in a cell, it's like a fire. It damages one, the free radical jumps to the next molecule, break, and it's just do all kinds of cellular damage, breaking up the molecules of the cell, causing cancer, breaking down the cell, doing all kinds of bad things. So the body has immune system, knows that. It recognizes it. And right along the lining of your artery, there are lots of little guard cells. They're out there on the front lines. Call them macrophages or the big eaters. These macrophages, their job is when it finds one of these, it senses it immediately, and it gobbles it up to get rid of it. Of course, the problem is there's so much of it. It's gobbling up another one, gobbling up another one, gobbling up another one. And these cells just swell up. They are so full of this bad fat they're gobbling up because our meals are so full of fat. All of these fried oils and stuff, and they're doing their bet to gobble them all up because they're all bad, damaged molecules. And, they're gobbling, and these molecules, they just swell up. Under the microscope, they look real foamy, so they call them foam cells. But they start building up in here. And this whole thing is building up right here. And of course, they start breaking down, and other cells come in to try to help them out, and they also turn into foam cells. And pretty soon, 
we get this thickened layer here. And underneath this layer is all of this cholesterol lipid deposit here. It's all these immune cells where it's tacking all of this bad fat and it just lines the arteries. Now, if you come back and get an ultrasound, we can take a look at your artery and see how much of this you are building up in your artery. What we're measuring is your lifetime collection. We're not measuring your, like when you do a blood test, they're measuring how much is flowing by in your blood. But that's just what happens to be flowing by at that minute, which sort of reflects what you ate that day. Whereas this, we're actually measuring how much is actually damaged in your artery, how much of this thickening, hardening of the arteries do we have going on here. And of course, as it gets worse, it can even become calcified. Calcium crystals can start depositing in there. And uh, <coughs> it can get thicker and thicker. The other side can get thicker here. And uh, the real problem, of course, we get this narrowing. And if, if this is one of the arteries in your heart, and it gets too narrow, we start getting angina or heart pain. But the real problem is not the angina or the narrowing. The problem is this little layer of endothelium, when it's on top of this cholesterol plaque, it can't be as healthy. And sometimes it will form a little crack or break in it there. And if this endothelium starts to crack and break open, there's a rough spot. Now the problem with that is your blood has a very nice protective mechanism to make blood clots. This is so you don't bleed. When you cut an artery, put pressure for a moment, and pretty soon what happens to that little cut? It stops bleeding. Why? There's little platelets. They're like little teeny cells that go along here. If they sense a cut, they suddenly go sticky and stick to it and start sticking to each other. A whole bunch of them, they all go sticky, and they all stick and clog up that little cut, and you stop bleeding. And there's other proteins in here, fibrin and different things, and they all turn into a blood clot. And together they make a blood clot totally sealing off so you don't bleed. Well, the problem is when you get a little crack in the endothelium from this cholesterol plaque, those platelets see that and they say, oh, here's a cut. Let's plug this up so he doesn't bleed. And suddenly we got platelets going sticky and sticking on here and triggering each other. And pretty soon we got a whole bunch of platelets going on here and they're triggering the fibrin. And pretty soon a blood clot forms here. And we can go in just a few minutes, we can go from nice blood flow to totally blocked blood flow. Now, if this was a little artery in your heart that this was happening in, that's what a heart attack is. When you suddenly form a clot and block off one of the little arteries in your heart, that's a heart attack. If you did that in one of the arteries of your brain, that's a stroke. And this is how we have heart attacks and strokes. When we develop a little crack, the blood clot forms there and uh, goes on there. Now, if we want to turn this situation around before we get to, once this clot forms, you need to be in the ER, okay? And I'm going to inject some uh, uh, thrombolytic uh, medications in you to try to dissolve the blood clot. Or they will take you up to the cath lab and the cardiologist will put a catheter in the heart and they'll try to inject these thrombolytic agents directly into the heart. But either way, we're going to try to get those in there and dissolve the blood clot without getting too much and causing you to bleed all over the place and bleed out. So that's the challenge. Uh, but anyway, at that point, that's the only thing we can do. So if you're having a heart attack, get to the ER and let's try to unplug that before the heart downstream dies from a lack of blood supply. But short of that, you know, we just measured your artery and you can see stuff building up there so you know you've got something to work on. What can you do to try to prevent it from getting to that point that it's going to have a heart attack on you? Well, back to whole plants eaten whole. Same, same old, same old sentence here, whole plant foods eaten whole. So let's just follow this through on someone who has now switched their diet to whole plant foods eaten whole. So first of all, there's Nothing extra cholesterol bad stuff coming in here. There's no oxidized fat coming down here. Got this fix up here. So what's being absorbed in here? What's inside the LDL and the VLD trucks on the whole plant food eaten whole diet? Well, if they had some walnuts or some 
pecans or some coconut or avocado or sunflower seeds or any of these other sources of fats, what shape are they in? They're all clean and safe, right? Because you were chewing up the whole seeds. They weren't exposed to oxygen. There wasn't any oxidative damage. They weren't fried. And so now these trucks are no longer full of all of this bad stuff, so they're really not bad, are they? And as they're coming by, what happens to this right here? Well, the body was meant to actually clean up and take care of things. This right here is the battlefield debris because they were just overwhelmed by the huge amount that was coming in. If you think about it, how many meals a day do we have oxidized fat? I mean, breakfast, lunch, a supper. I mean, there's no stop. Almost every meal we have some added oil in. And as this added oil is coming in, we have no chance to ever get caught up or get ahead on this. We get behind on it and builds up this layer here. But what happens now once only good fat is coming through here, every single meal, there's no more bad coming in, well, the cells, those gobble up the stuff, can actually start cleaning up the debris, and they can actually package it up and start to get rid of it. And you know how they get rid of it? Well, they put it in little trucks again. I'm going to put another one out here. It's another little truck here. This truck is called HDL. Some people call it good cholesterol. Anyway, what is it? It's actually, they're taking all of this debris right here, they're packaging it up, and where are they doing with it? They're sending it to the liver. And what does the liver do with all of this bad stuff? Here, I'll put some of that green one. It's all full of, it's all full of that bad damaged lipid material from the arterial wall. So it's all packaged up inside there, and it goes to the liver. And what's the liver do with it? Yeah, it's going to put it back in the bile and get rid of it. And of course, as it comes out here, it's going to be soaked up in this fiber sponge. And what's going to happen to it? it goes right out of the body, right? You flush it down the toilet. So you see what we just did? We took this bad oxidized cholesterol and fat out of the artery wall, sent it to the liver, and got it out of the body. Would you like to reverse your arterial sclerosis? This is what's doing it. That's why they call it the good cholesterol. What's good about it? Where it's going. <laughs> yeah, it's the destination. It's not actually good. It's full of bad fat. But it's good because of its destination. It's on its way out. It's trucking it out. So if you want to turn around this disease process, again, going back to the whole plant, this is why it works. This is why people can actually narrow out the arteries. You'll see on the table back there by the ultrasound, I have a picture of two arteries. One of them is a very narrowed, blocked off artery, really bad arterial sclerosis, much more than I've drawn here, very badly narrowing one of the arteries in the heart. And the second picture is the exact same artery in the same patient 32 months later after he switched to a whole plant food diet. And it's wide open and clean. We see this over and over again. In a few years of turning this diet around, these badly damaged arteries open wide up, good flow, nice, clean, healthy endothelium, and your risk of a heart attack goes essentially to zero again. Even though it's the number one cause of death, nobody has to have this disease. You know, God has given to us a real gift in the knowledge that has been allowed to come to us in the area of health reform. Coming back to the simple diet of Eden, eating the fruits, vegetables, and seeds as near as possible to the way God made them will be as healthy as possible. But it's not just going to prevent or make us healthy. It places in our hands a tool that allows us to provide a gift of healing to the world around us. Like Jesus, we don't just have a doctrinal truth to preach. We also have a gift of healing to give to those who are sick and hurting. They're dying. They're very close to having a heart attack. They're, you may have already had a heart attack. They've got a few stents, or they're moving down that road. You've got something to give them that can totally change their physical life, save their life, turn it around. It's very simple, and it works. We see it over and over when we go to one of these centers where we actually keep track of the people and stuff. Every time we do it, arteries open up, 
cholesterol comes down, diabetes reverses, arthritis goes away, and disease after disease of these major lifestyle diseases that are present in this country are totally treatable and reversible.